Good morning. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. You know, as I was considering this uh, text, I was reminded of a track meet that went, went to many years ago. Um, I think William might have still been in middle school. I wasn't sure, but it was his track meet. And uh, Stacy and Jeremy and I were kind of standing over there on the, uh, at the corner, uh, kind of in a line, uh, kind of uh, observing what was going on that day. And one of William's friends came up and was talking to us. And he didn't realize, I mean, he'd never met us before, but uh, partway through the conversation, we realized that he thought, uh, say, I w Jeremy was standing here, I was standing here, and Stacy was standing here. And he thought Jeremy was the dad and I was the son. And I'm not sure how he got that. It was one of William's friends. And we asked him, how in the world did you get that? And uh, he said, I don't know. Maybe it was just the way he was standing. And I looked over at Jeremy, and he's got his dark sunglasses on. His arms are crossed. He's actually a little taller than I am. And I thought, okay, so I guess dads are supposed to, you know, be like that. And I guess I was smiling. I don't know. But uh, anyway, something about her behavior made him think that... Um, Jeremy was the dad and I was the son. The uh, text we're going to be looking at this morning is talking about behavior. And specifically, uh, there's a certain way that uh, Christians act and a certain way that Christians uh, behave and think. And um, so let's go ahead and read the uh, passage from Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And neither do people light a lamp and put it under the bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may See your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so this is, comes at uh, the beginning, uh, toward the beginning of the, uh, what we typically call the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And if the, the main theme of this is uh, the kingdom of God. All of us belong to the kingdom of God, a kingdom that Jesus said is not of this world. And here is what it looks like when you live in the kingdom of God. And part of the way Jesus describes us is both as salt and light. What does that mean for us? Well, you are salt when you are fully present. Salt is no good if it's not present. Salt is no good if it's not salty and actually present. I remember seeing a uh, book title years ago, and the title of the book was Out of the Salt Shaker. And that's basically one of the points we need to get from this is that we need to get out of the salt shaker. So I started thinking about what does it mean to get out of the salt shaker and get into the world and to be salt in the world. And I started considering all the different ways that salt is used. I think most of us are aware that salt is used as a purifying agent. In fact, in uh, one of the uh, instructions in the book of Exodus chapter 30 was that when you take incense and you offer it up to God, the incense is to be mixed with salt and then it will be pure and holy. And so even there it's used as a purifying agent. It keeps it from going bad and uh, it wouldn't spoil and could be offered up to God as pure and holy. And I thought about all the ways that we use salt today. Um, I like to stop by the quick shop every now and then and get a stick of beef jerky has a long shelf life because it's been dried and it has been uh, salted. A friend of mine from Harding sent me a bag of biltong. Everyone ever heard of biltong before? It's basically South African beef jerky. I, mean, I actually think it's a lot better, but uh, it's salted too. It was, uh, uses salt and, and vinegar. Then I thought about, uh, you know, when we go to the store, we have uh, uh, go to the soup aisle, and there's all those cans of soup, right? And they say they're high in sodium, and it probably helps to uh, preserve it. Then I remembered my grandmother. On my mom's side, uh, at age 70, she had all of her teeth. In fact, mom used to talk about how my mom has more teeth than I do. And she had never used toothpaste in all her life. You know what she brushed her teeth with? Salt. She brushed her teeth with salt. 
Um, I looked online for all the different uses of salt, and I didn't realize there were so many different kinds. Salt, salt is used as a cleaner on many different things. Evidently, it's good for sweat stains and fabric. Uh, it's good for cleaning off uh, scope, soap scum. It's good for cleaning out the garbage disposal, and the list goes on and on. Oh, and it's even good for cleaning off the drive when you have uh, ice on the drive, right? And so uh, salt is used as a purifying agent. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. We are like a purifying agent in a corrupt world. And it doesn't happen unless we are actually present in the world. And then I thought about the way we typically use salt every day. It's used as a seasoning, right? When you use just the right amount of salt on your food, what does it do to it? it uh, they say it enhances the flavor, right? You don't want to use too much, but it brings out the best. And hopefully that's the effect that we have on everyone in, and everything around us, right? We bring out the best. We focus on what is excellent, what is pure, what is lovely. We bring out the best. We are not a tasteless people. We serve the Lord of life. We know how to savor life to its fullest. Because Christ has purified us. We're a purifying agent. We bring out the best. And you know, it reminds me of a campaign I participated in several years ago down in uh, Arizona. I met uh, a lady there who had been a Christian for about five years. And she was very concerned about her grandchildren. She had three granddaughters. And uh, she said their life is just a mess. Um, all of them, uh, she said their life, her, her words were, their life is a train wreck. And one of them, she nearly lost to drugs. Um, they were living in less than desirable situations. And, uh, but she made up her mind uh, never to cut them off. She said she's always going to stay connected in some way to them. And uh, she, uh, as much as she could be, she tried to provide guidance, to try to be a good example, and to demonstrate the faithfulness of Christ. And eventually they started to come around. And uh, when we showed up, she uh, sent several of us to go and visit them. And uh, after a couple of visits, every single one of her granddaughters, all three of them decided that they would accept Jesus as Lord and become Christians. And so there were three baptisms that week. All of them were living with their boyfriends, and so they decided they needed to make it right. They'd been living with them for a while, and they said, we need to get married. And so there were also three weddings that week. And uh, you would not recognize them today from the people that they used to be. Every single one of them are radiant. Every single one of them are beautiful with the beauty of Christ in them. Their life has been transformed I started to say the life was turned upside down, but it's actually it's turned right side up. And I think a large part of it had to be because of the influence of Grandma, who never gave up on them. That's part of what it means to be salt in the world. Get out of the salt shaker and to be present in the lives of the people around you. Brings us to our next point. We are light when we're visible in good works. This goes beyond just being an influence on someone. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works. And notice the two analogies that Jesus used here. He says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And he also talks about, uh, I forgot to bring it up here with me. He also talks about the light, when you light a lamp. Oh, and here's what they used to look like. During the time of Jesus, they would have looked like this. This is a typical household lamp from the time of Jesus. Not an actual one. It would have cost too much money. This is a replica. Uh, but they would take it, and they would uh, pour the oil in the hole here, and they would have a little wick, and, of course, you wouldn't want to put it up high away from the kids so it didn't get knocked over, right? And it gave, gives light to all who are in the house. The point with both of those analogies, the city set on a hill and the lamp on the lampstand is that they are in a visible place. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. You are the light of the what? Of the world. Not just the light of your family, not just the light of the church, although we do let our light shine pretty good in church, right? But we are the light of the world. But those driving by, all they see when they see the building is what? A building, right? Uh, but when they see us involved in their lives, when they see us loving each other, when they see us loving God, then they see the light of Christ. 
Jesus never said the building is the light of the world. He says that you are the light of the world. And that happens when we serve others in the name of Christ. And Christian service happens everywhere. It doesn't just happen here in the building. Matter of fact, more of it happens outside of the building than happens here in the building. And I'm thinking of some of the examples that Jesus uh, demonstrated. You remember uh, as Jesus was uh, nearing the end of his time and the end of his ministry, uh, the, the Bible says in John chapter 13 that he got up and he's with his, uh, with his disciples. He uh, takes off his outer cloak and he girds himself. And what does he begin to do? He gets down on his hands and knees and begins to wash their feet. He serves them as an example for them. Jesus said he didn't come to the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world, and he also tells us that we are the light of the world. And so uh, we, through our good works, are a light to those around us. That's why Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, Do not fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but be rich. How, are you gonna, how, how can you be rich? Be rich in good works. Be rich in good works. What does that mean to be rich in good works? What does that say to you? It means that being rich in good works, doing good works, ought to be a defining characteristic of a follower of Christ. And it's how we let our light shine. This is how the church stands out with the light of Christ in the world. Did you know that historically from the very beginning that Christians, that the Christian church has always been known for doing good works? From the very day, from day one, one of the things that Christians were known for was uh, helping to uh, bury loved ones when people weren't able to afford to bury their loved ones. They were known for feeding those who didn't have any, enough food and feeding those who were in need. They were known for the care of the sick. When everyone else was running from the plague, they were running to the plague in order to help those who were sick, often at great risk to themselves, and oftentimes they got sick themselves and died themselves. They were willing to take a risk, and this is how they stood out. Oh, last week there was a guy that knocked on the door right out here, and... Um, uh, he was wearing a big uh, backpack. He had a long, scraggly beard. And uh, uh, anyway, he said, uh, I, I thought, you know, he was looking for some kind of a handout or looking for some money. But he told me that he was on the rails and trying to get from California and had come from Boston. I didn't know anyone did that sort of thing anymore. But he said the train had stopped here in town and didn't look like it was going any further, didn't know what he wanted to do. And I offered him money. <laughs> and he said, no, I don't need your money. I wasn't quite sure what he wanted. And after talking for a little while, I figured out what he wanted was for some way to continue the trip. And he already had money, and so that really wasn't what he needed. He, but he needed some way to continue the trip. And I was just kind of like, I, I'm not sure what to tell you. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, you know, is this guy safe? And I don't know if that sort of thing actually ever runs through your head. And I didn't know what to tell him. I'm watching him walk away, starting to head up the hill over here. And you know what went through my mind? When Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, you know the story? There was some guy that was in need by the side of the road, and this uh, Samaritan comes by and helps this guy when the other two holy men didn't, and uh, even at risk to himself and even at, uh, at great expense to himself, he stopped to help this guy. And you know why Jesus told that story? Somebody had asked him after he said, you know, the greatest commands are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And somebody asked, well, then who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the story. Who is my neighbor? And I'm looking at this guy walking right up over here, and I said, there goes my neighbor. And so I hopped in the car and went after him. And I said, I, here's a few suggestions. You know, I could uh, take you somewhere. Obviously, I'm limited by the distance, but I can take you somewhere that might be able to help you uh, continue uh, your trip. And they said, do you want to go north? There's a major city, Omaha, this way, or there's a truck stop out over here. And we talked for a little bit, and he's going through all the uh, pros and cons and the, uh, you know, the, uh, of uh, going here or going there. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, still started thinking once again, what if this guy has a gun? You know, what if he has a knife? 
but I thought, wait, wait a minute. That's, that's not, Jesus didn't even mention that, right? You help those who are in need. So he decided to go over here to the uh, truck stop. And as we're driving over there, um, he starts to tell me his story about how he got stuck where he was. And uh, I could tell you that story, but that's really not relevant to the point I'm making. But I remember when we stopped, um, he was about ready to get out of the car. And he said, thank you so much. I didn't know what, it, what to do next. And uh, I asked him if we could pray together before uh, he continued on his uh, journey. And in the middle of, his, uh, middle of the prayer, I looked up and I started seeing the tear coming down the side of his face. And he's got out. I thought, you know, that guy was just harmless. He was just somebody that needed, uh, needed help. And I started to ask myself, you know, where was my faith? Where was my faith? Um, being a light, what kind of light would I have been if I just said, I don't know what to tell you, and just sent him on his way? And I told him before he got out of the car, and I, I told him about my struggle. I said, you know, I initially wasn't going <laughs> to do this. I was more comfortable with giving you some money and sending you on your way. But Jesus tells me that you're my neighbor and that I need to help you. And so that's why I'm doing this, because of what Jesus tells me. And he really, he said, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you were a follower of Jesus and that you were able to do that. The only thing I regret is I didn't take the time to share the gospel with him. But, you know, this is how we let our light shine. This little light of mine, you know, that we sing as a kid, I'm going to let it shine, right? I'm not going to hide it under a bush. Oh, no. We let our light shine. How? By the things that we do. Be rich in good works, even if there's some risk involved. And I'm thinking about Jesus. Didn't he take a risk when he left the safety of heaven and came down here to earth? I need to get out of the salt shaker and I need to get into the lives of people. And do good in the name of Christ. That brings me to the last point. In the name of Christ. You are liked when you are visibly invisible. What did Jesus say? Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father who is in heaven. And that, what that tells me is that what people need to see is not me. They need to see beyond me. They need to see Christ in me so that they'll glorify God not me my motivation needs to bring needs to be to bring glory to God and bring attention to Christ not to myself not for any other reason not because it makes me feel better about myself though it does usually do that uh, not for any other reason other than to bring the glory to God God has blessed us richly and he wants us to share his blessing with others whether it's a blessing of food the blessing of clothing love support, redemption and transformation, the gospel, all of these things we share in the name of Christ. It's a definite problem if I do good works but I don't share the gospel and it's a definite problem if I share the gospel but don't do good works. Jesus did both. He ministered to the sick. He fed those who were hungry. He was a friend to those who were lonely and the outcast. And he shared the bread of life, those who were spiritually hungry. He did all of these things. You know, I remember when we were still uh, living in Searcy, very limited income. Both of us were uh, students. We had uh, kids at home. And I remember uh, uh, sometime in December, the little church that we used to drive up to every weekend, two hours to the north, one of the members of the church owned a little airplane out in the field in front of his house, and he decided uh, he was going to bring a bunch of Christmas presents to the kids. He didn't figure we'd probably have much, and so he loaded them up in his little plane, and he flew down to Searcy in order to bring those presents to us kids. And I remember we were so grateful. We were thankful. Thank you very much for this. And I remember his response was something to the effect of, God has blessed us, and we just want to share his blessing. And that's what he did. He gave, instead of accepting the thanks, he gave the attention to God. That's part of what it means. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Being visibly invisible means doing good works and giving the glory to God. We need to magnify God and not ourselves. And the response we want is not how great I am. <laughs> The response we want is how great God is because he is truly the one that is great. You know, the scripture reading this morning reminds us 
that our purpose here is to represent Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Him and not ourselves. We've been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. And we do that part by, partly by being salt and partly by being light and giving the glory to God. You know, that's what Jesus did when He came to this earth, earth right? Uh, he drew the attention away from people and He drew the attention to God. We're reminded of that by our figure here on the wall. Jesus came and died on our sins, died for our sins. He uh, uh, arose from the grave and, and he's coming back again. And if you've not accepted him as your Lord and Savior and you believe that he died for your sins and he was buried and rose from the grave and you're ready to be baptized and become a child of God. If you've already done that, I want to suggest something. You know, all of us do good works individually, but there's something about doing good works together. One light in a dark room is significant, but a whole bunch of lights in a dark room, well, that is fantastic. And a bunch of lights together can make a huge impact. You know, it's encouraging to work together in the name of Christ, isn't it? When we do something meaningful by ourselves, it's encouraging, but it's even more encouraging when we do meaningful things in the name of Christ, when we do good things. And so I have a, a handout that I want to hand out uh, this morning before we, uh, before we close. And we've been talking about getting together to do some like brainstorming or what are some things that we can do or we can plan on doing for this upcoming year. And that's what this is designed to do. So what I'd like for you to do is to, to read the uh, paragraph front and back and then there's a half here where you can actually put some of your feedback over here. I'd like you to detach that and return that to me and I'll go ahead and compile everything and we'll use that kind of in preparation for our coming together. And there's also feedback about when to be the best time to come together. I'm going to go ahead and uh, you to be thinking about, you know, what, uh, what is uh, my strength, what are our strengths as the uh, body of Christ, and what is it that God is calling me to do, what is it that God is calling us to do, what are the possibilities, and uh, so at uh, this time we're going to go ahead and sing a song while I leave you with that thought, and if you need to uh, respond, uh, please do so as we stand and sing.